everyone. Now we can uh, start the second, uh, the second part of this uh, panel. We are going to explore uh, more the national context and uh, how different actors can support national human rights authorities in ensuring human rights protection and borders. How can we exert pressure to ensure that there is political will at the national level to safeguard human rights, which we have learned so far uh, from so many years of advocacy and recommendations that are very difficult to be protected. And uh, in a way or in another, unfortunately, uh, there have been uh, utopi for our countries. Albania actually has not been hit as uh, at the same level as other uh, uh, neighbor countries or EU countries. We had had a less um, stronger crisis, let's say, or, or a kind of crisis with respect to the, to the migrants, but still we have faced problems with our police, with the people at the border, with in effectively uh, protecting the rights of migrants at the borders. And from that perspective, I understand how difficult it has been in other countries like uh, Greece, as, as it was mentioned previously, or Croatia, and uh, as well as uh, definitely in, in Spain, uh, that will be one of the, of the protagonists of, the, of this uh, panel. I'm looking forward to hearing in this in this panel from the national human rights uh, institutions on their own experience with advising national governments and from partners of the European Council of Refugees and Exiles or EU Fundamental Rights Agency and ODIR on their perspective observing national uh, developments on border management and where they see the current gaps and pathways for achieving respect for migrants' rights in this context. Uh, we are gonna have, as it is in our uh, panel, we are gonna have four uh, speakers that will uh, participate in this panel. Each of them will have uh, exactly, each of them will have exactly 10 minutes. Uh, so we are going to have, as I mentioned before, Carmen Comas Matamira, Director of International Relations in the office of Ombudsman of Spain and a very dear friend of, of Henry and of, and of me, myself. Then it will be the acting head of democratization department at ODIR, Ms. Megan Fitzgerald, uh, Catherine Ullard, Secretary General of European Council for, of, for Refugees and Exiles from ECRE, and then uh, last but not least, Adriano Silvestri, Program Management uh, Program Manager on Asylum Migration and EU Fundamental Rights Agency. All of them will have 10 minutes, uh, and then we will open the floor for questions and intervention. First, I'd like to begin the discussion by giving the floor to my colleague Carmen Comas Matamira, Director of International Relations at the Ombudsman of Spain, as I mentioned previously. Uh, Carmen, Thank you, first of all, for being here with us. As we heard throughout the discussions yesterday and today, national human rights institutions possess a wide range of tools to monitor, promote, and protect the human rights of migrants at national level, such as carrying out on-site visits at border police stations, in detention centers, and reception facilities, and reporting on any shortcoming, advising governments on draft laws, and reporting on the findings of their activities. Some can also receive individual complaints on alleged violations by border guards and other authorities. However, the recommendations of NHRIs are not always acted upon, and this is the main problem. Migration and border management is a very important part of the work of the Spanish Ombudsman. A recent report of the Ombudsman sheds the light on the situation in the Canary Islands. Which recommendations or actions taken by the Spanish Ombudsman have proved to be most effective in terms of follow-up? What do you uh, say are some ingredients for ensuring follow-up recommendations? Have you particularly benefited from cooperation with other actors in your work on migration? The floor is yours, Carmen. 10 minutes. Thanks very much, Irina. <clears throat> Thanks very much for your very warm presentation. Uh, the sense of friendship, of course, is mutual and I'm really privileged for uh, having the opportunity 
to work with you for all these years. Um, I will try to share a presentation that I have prepared. Uh, thanks very much to Henry for, for inviting not only me, uh, but my institution, which I'm representing here today. Um, I will not uh, stop in, uh, in all uh, the, the activities and the, and the role that the, the Ombudsman has, because most of you know about it. Um, I will just say that uh, the Ombudsman uh, prepares uh, reports, of course, as every NHRI does. Um, he may submit case reports on matters which are considered particularly serious or urgent. And as a matter of fact, this year, as Serinda said, the institution has issued a specific report regarding migration on the Canary Islands, bearing in mind the amount of arrivals to the island during 2020 and 2021. Uh, besides the role as Ombudsman, the Spanish Parliament gave the institution the functions of National Preventive Mechanism Against Torture, NPM, in November uh, 20, 2009, sorry. And of course, the visits to immigration detention centers are something done on a regular basis, of course. Um, the Ombudsman, of course, reports to international and regional human rights mechanisms, such as the United Nations and the Council of Europe, as well as cooperates with NGOs, civil society networks, and, and regional bodies like, like ENRI, of course. Um, I will tell you about the, the Spanish context in, uh, concerning migration. Migration has become a matter of great importance in Southern Europe, of course, and in Spain in particular of the last few decades. In light of this, over the last few years, the Spanish Ombudsman has paid particular attention to the phenomenon as evidenced by the recurrent action in this field that is addressed in our annual reports and monographs. To mention just some of the most relevant, I shall refer to the action taken in 2017 and 2018 in response to the increase in irregular arrivals along Spain's Mediterranean coast. During that period, and based on an announced visit to the main points of arrival, the institution recorded everything that we observed and made a number of recommendations related to reception conditions, means of detecting individuals with international protection needs, minors and victims of trafficking in human beings, and how these individuals were treated. In 2020, we began taking action similar to the steps mentioned above. However, the situation is more complex now because of the COVID, of course. The standout feature of last year was the arrival of 23,023 individuals on the Canary Islands, as you can see in the slide. To this, we must add a further 16,000 individuals who reached peninsular Spain and also the Balearic Islands, and further, 2,000 individuals who access the country through Ceuta and Melilla, the enclaves in, in northern Africa, Spanish enclaves in northern Africa. The flow of arrivals uh, from some countries in sub-Saharan Africa is a result of a series of factors that have transpired in that geographical location of the, the last few years. This include a sharp demographic increase, the negative impact of climate change, social inequalities, and certain armed conflicts. On top of that, there is a new factor, the increase in the number of undocumented individuals who have traveled to the Atlantic coast of Spain from Morocco. More recently, an unprecedented arrival of an estimated 9,000 migrants in Spain's Ceuta enclave took place from May 17 to May 19, two days. Most of them have been pushed back to Morocco by the Spanish government. At least 1,500 1, children between the ages of 7 and 15 were among those who crossed into Ceuta in the span of 48 hours. While many have already been returned through family reunification and tracing assistance, some 800 remain accommodated in a warehouse in Ceuta. The Spanish Ombudsman has initiated an investigation with the administration. The institution is paying special attention to the situation of minors and asylum seekers whose rights must be especially safeguarded. Right now, the Spanish Ombudsman himself is carrying out a visit to Ceuta Melilla, where he's holding meetings with authorities, civil servants, NGOs that work in the field. 
the figures I've mentioned, all to make us reflect and change how we analyze the situation from the standpoint of exerting control over the arrival of undocumented individuals, the rather hackneyed pull factor, and the fight against mafias. While it's necessary, the security argument does not always go hand in hand with an analysis of the actual means that individuals have at their disposal for entering Spain. This is a crucial challenge that ought to prompt a global and urgent analysis on how to regulate migration flows. Such an analysis should consider adapting regulation to make migration safe and possible. Borders are places where human rights are too often in jeopardy, especially those of migrants with special needs. States reluctant to accept the constraints on national policies set by international human rights law has been particularly acute in the case of irregular migrants. In Adela Cortinas, which is um, words, which is a Spanish philosopher, what lies deeply within this is a feeling of aversion, of rejection of the poor, the aporophobia. What bothers first of the immigrants and then of the refugees is not that they are foreigners, but that they are poor. All phobias are social pathologies that are expressed in the form of hatred of the different, but these ones comes must. The time has come to address certain changes to our regulation and policies. For instance, chance in consular policies can be made considering the options that job seeker visas offer and facilitating procedures for regrouping families or receiving students in our country. The Spanish Ombudsman has already worked on this subject. The institution I represent believes that we should make the most of the opportunity presented by the migratory crisis Spain is living. We ought to look beyond the emergency situation and adopt a migration policy that takes the specific needs of our job market and society into account within the framework of European policy and the respect of human rights. Let me tell you about our experience monitoring the borders on the Canary Islands. This will give you a practical overview of what I have already mentioned during this intervention. Uh, I will not be focusing on recommendations. I have prepared a couple, of, uh, a couple of slides, but of course, I will not be bothering you. I can share with you all this, all these, um, sorry. Um, all these recommendations are including in a monographic report called Migration on the Canary Islands. Uh, the significant increase in arrivals on the Canary Islands during 2020 and 21 found that the area's reception capacity and turn activating a range of provisional arrangements on the go in order to deal with the situation into a necessity. It was for this reason that two teams of technical staff from the Spanish Ombudsman Office traveled to the Canary Islands archipelago for two weeks. The aim was to analyze the reception conditions for individuals uh, with as much precision as possible. And this was supplemented by an institutional visit by the Ombudsman himself, who was meeting with uh, local authorities and NGOs. Um, particular attention was also paid to understanding the characteristics of the legal assistance provided to arrivals and the role played in this field by interpreters, which is really very, very important. Also, we paid a lot of attention to unaccompanied alien minors and the conditions of, of receptions. Uh, we, we are about to, to close. We need to close up. Sorry. Okay. So uh, I was just having the last uh, the last slide, <laughs> but uh, I can share it with you. Um, it's what uh, how the the institutions the NHRIs can can do to change uh, respect human rights of migrants at borders, and then in this slide you have some of our our proposals. We need that to be on field is really important to have direct contact with NGOs, uh, with lawyers, uh, and cooperation with authorities, civil servants, NGOs and pay, of course, special attention to vulnerable profiles. And that's all. Sorry for for the long presentation. No, thank you very much, Carmen. It was not long at all. It was very, very interesting, at least for for me, as always. And uh, but uh, I think that the problems are problems 
that are really multidimensional problems. And that's why even the solutions that I saw that you have presented or, or recommendations that you have presented as uh, as Ombudsman Institution of Spain uh, are directed in different areas and aim to have a comprehensive resolution of this, uh, of this issue or this problem, or at least 10, because of course we know we don't, uh, the answers to everything and the solutions to Thing and uh, but it needs to be a solution that will be comprehensive of uh, of the realities in the countries from where the migrants arrive and there is the 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 most long lasting let's say solution as well as in our um, in our countries that are the recipient uh, countries and definitely uh, we would like to talk more about that in our in our uh, questions. Uh, part of the of the panel. But now I'd like to turn to Odir uh, to expand on common challenges found across the OSCE region when implementing a human rights approach to border management. And definitely OSCE includes even countries, even recipient countries, some of them, some of the recipient, uh, uh, some of the of the countries that from where they are coming. So from that perspective, um, I would definitely uh, be very interesting to to see the the position uh, of Ms. Fitzgerald, the acting head of the Democratization Department of ODIR, uh, with respect to their report, the recent report that they have published on border police monitoring in the OSCE region. I will give the floor to you. You have your 10 uh, minutes shot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Balanka. Um, and distinguished colleagues and participants, it's my great honor and really a pleasure to take part in this very topical meeting and have the opportunity to share with you the recommendations developed by ODIR, uh, the OSCE's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, on, as the moderator mentioned, human rights monitoring of border police practices. I would also like to thank Henry for organizing this event. I'm delighted to be able to continue our conversation on this very important topic with colleagues from ENRI and other national human rights institutions and international institutions, including FRA, OHCHR, UNHCR, and the European Commission. And importantly, and most importantly, maybe civil society organizations. It's a great pleasure to see familiar faces. And I know some of you joined us in mid-April for the discussion of ODIR's research findings on this border police monitoring practices across the region. But we've also been joined by many of you on other occasions, and we've had an event with the Croatian Ombudsman uh, on this exact topic on uh, human rights uh, for migrants at the border. The protection of human rights is at the core of the OEC commitments, and this includes the rights of people crossing national borders. Participating states have repeatedly underlined that the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms extends to migrant workers, refugees, and asylum seekers, and have agreed to take steps to combat discrimination, intolerance, and xenophobia. As part of ODIR's work to strengthen implementation of the commitments across the region, the office develops guidance and recommendations to help identify and promote good practices in the fields of migrant integration, human rights, tolerance, and non-discrimination. Responding to continuing challenges and divisions linked to the protection of migrants' rights, in particular at the borders, in 2020, we commissioned the report that was, was previously mentioned to collect good practices in the independent monitoring of border police, and importantly, to develop recommendations. As part of this research, governmental and non-governmental stakeholders already involved in human rights monitoring, most commonly detention and forced return monitoring, were invited to share and reflect on their experiences. And our expert reached out to a wide range of these individuals um, and institutional contacts, which we are grateful that contributed, including Enri. The inputs from national human rights institutions in particular were invaluable in this research, and it's clearly an area of human rights work where NHRIs have an extremely significant role to play. Many NHRIs have been engaged in human rights monitoring in the context of asylum and migration management. 
their broad human rights mandates, as well as investigative powers guaranteed in law, have allowed them to monitor a wide range of issues and to make these important recommendations, as previously mentioned, to governments and state authorities. The research findings were presented at our April event, but also that event was an opportunity um, to further inform the report and, and inform the final version of the report, which was recently published earlier this month. Um, and I was asked, as the moderator mentioned, to share some of the main recommendations from this work. The ODA report presents recommendations which fall into four categories ensuring political support, creating an enabling environment, ensuring the functional independence and efficiency of monitors, and last but not least, promoting cooperation and capacity building for border police and monitoring. First of all, on political will and political support for establishing effective monitoring mechanisms, it is fundamental. Participating states should provide political support for the establishment and implementation of independent border police monitoring at the national level and work together to provide this support at the international level. NHRIs, ombuds institutions, and civil society should be politically supported to ensure that they can engage in such national mechanisms and should advocate for such political support. The context of border police operations entails a significant risk of human rights violations for migrants who may well be in vulnerable situations. No law enforcement is immune to potential instances of abuse of power, excessive use of force, or systemic deficiencies. States should recognize that human rights monitoring at borders is a legitimate activity to document deficiencies through providing fact-based observations and actionable recommendations. All participating states are committed to implementing international obligations, all OSC participating states, um, and OSC commitments in all border operations, and should take action to raise awareness of the ap applicable standards among their agencies and personnel. Participating states should also take positive action, mapping and facilitating opportunities for dialogue and formalizing cooperation between law enforcement agencies and organizations that are engaged in monitoring and should ensure these clear mechanisms for victims' rights violations uh, that they have access to legal redress. While political will is essential, it is, it is also important to provide an enabling environment for effective uh, border police monitoring. Given the obstacles faced by organizations and individual human rights monitors, participating states in consultation with NHRIs and non-state actors should take proactive steps to establish border monitoring mechanisms and engage civil society stakeholders in their development. Where monitoring mechanisms exist, relevant state authorities should periodically engage in review processes to ensure their efficiency. It is fundamental to make sure that laws and policies do not criminalize or prevent the legitimate activities of non-governmental organizations. That criminalization was discussed in the previous panels today. And, uh, and that human rights defenders are not prosecuted under facilitation charges for carrying out such activities. States should commit adequate resources to building monitoring capacity and to fund the costs associated with the implementation of monitoring while upholding the functional independence of non-governmental monitors. It's also very important that states make the best use of expertise and resources in the OSC and other international organizations, as well as monitoring bodies to provide training for law enforcement agencies, including on specific standards related to migration and asylum. As already discussed, more training is needed. Um, that was one of the things that was discussed as additionally needed today. In terms of ensuring functional independence and efficiency, state authorities and non-state actors engaged in developing supporting and implementing border police monitoring cooperation should ensure and that cooperation is not hindered by unnecessary restrictions on monitoring beyond safety and security measures that are genuinely required for specific border contexts. This includes ensuring human rights monitors can access locations critical for monitoring 
including remote or unstaffed areas and access all information relevant to their work without excessive administrative burdens and unwarranted use of security classifications. Monitors should also have the physical space and opportunity to speak privately and confidentially with individuals targeted by border police operations, subject solely to their informed consent and free from risk of retribution or disadvantage. As discussed at the end of the previous panel, it is essential to develop and implement complaint and reparation procedures that provide effective access to justice and redress to migrants for human rights violations. I agree with the suggestion that we should be doing more to look at access to justice issues. And finally, it's critical that states agree on clear pathways to follow up on reports and recommendations made by monitors in a timely manner, bearing in mind the primary obligation to respect the rights of those targeted by policing. We also uh, have in the reports a number of recommendations regarding cooperation at the international level, which this event like today work towards um, and uh, which national human rights institutions can play a specific role in, in forming, in coordinating with the national actors and authorities to support uh, to learn from the experience from monitoring and inform the capacity building trainings for both law enforcement agencies and other competent authorities. And we can also do more to work at, on the developing of this uh, sh information sharing at the international level. But I will uh, wrap up with this. Um, just to mention that ODIR is working to develop training for border monitors that are based on our longstanding training for human rights defenders um, that works on both skills and security aspects for those monitors, um, which would be provided for uh, those engaged in border monitoring, including from NHRIs. And I wanted to mention um, the previous speaker noted the real need to modify regulations. Um, and one underused tool that ODIR offers is uh, legal opinions, legal reviews of any potential legislation or new regulations. Um, and NHRIs are an, a body, an institution that can request these legal opinions from ODIR. Um, so I would encourage you all, if you are looking at developing new regulations or new legislation, um, I would encourage you to seek out that assistance from ODI. Um, Also, previously discussed in the earlier panel today was the judiciary and access to justice. That is something that ODI cl closely works on. And I'm personally interested in exploring how we could look at more access to justice issues as well, um, together with NHRIs um, for in the, particularly in the migration context. Um, there are many more recommendations in the report and I gladly share it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you very much for your uh, very comprehensive presentation and actually for uh, concrete recommendations that I see uh, your as made in, within this report. Uh, we hope that they will be taken seriously from national authorities, but here uh, I am suggesting and uh, asking uh, my colleagues as well that the same report can be sent from us to the government as well as another mean of support uh, for sharing the same opinions and the same views and uh, in a way or another trying to include them as well or to make reference in these uh, OSC or D reports in our individual reports that we do issue on, on, on individual cases if, if we have. In a way or another, this will uh, help probably to make an echo to the same recommendations as well as will be a way for supporting our findings. Because as mentioned before, we as national human rights institutions and human rights defenders are sometimes in difficult situation in, in respect and, and particular in respect of, of migrants' uh, uh, rights or, or trying to protect migrants' rights. Uh, and this can be definitely a point of, of thinking uh, for us all too. Now I would like to hear from Catherine Ullard, 
Director of the European Council of Refugees and Exiles. Our organization has been doing some out your organization has been doing some outstanding advocacy work uh, with the EU institutions and EU Pact, but you have also been vocal about the need to improve advocacy at the capital level. How can advocacy at capital level be improved to raise standards on migrants' rights promotion and protection? Would what could be actually the, your key recommendation for NHRIs when fulfilling their mandate to promote and protect human rights and borders? Can cooperation with civil society can be enhanced? And if yes, how? Uh, these are some, some questions that we have posed for, for your presentation and uh, you have your 10 minutes to uh, enlighten us with your recommendations. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Chair. So I'm going to focus on two elements of the, the set of questions that were provided to me. How can advocacy at the capital level on regional uh, legal frameworks be improved and how to enhance cooperation between NHRIs and civil society? So starting with the first of those two topics, uh, advocacy at the capital level when it comes to regional frameworks. Talking first about the EU legal order. Um, I would argue that advocacy at the capital level on EU matters has long been a weakness and NHRIs have a key role to play. And sometimes for NGOs, it can be difficult due to resource constraints and other issues to make that link. So, um, in order to break it down, I think we can look at the different elements of implementing EU standards at uh, and targeting advocacy in capitals. Um, the first point I would say is in the transposition and implementation of uh, in policies of EU law. So that involves monitoring incorrect transposition and monitoring policies that contravene the EU are key. Um, I think this is particularly important because unfortunately these are the only realistic prospects of getting infringement procedures launched at the moment. Um, there needs to be certain clear uh, elements that the Commission can work with, including, for instance, incorrect transposition or what we see quite often is a policy that develops that actually contravenes some element of the acquis. The second point, lack of compliance with the asylum acquis. Um, as we know, there are key compliance gaps. Uh, some of those include lack of registration, appalling reception conditions, the so-called asylum lottery, a lack of respect for procedural guarantees of applicants, and various misuses of the Dublin regulation. Um, the lack of compliance is a major issue for us at ECRE. It's something where we see NHRI is also playing a role, particularly in the current context, where all eyes are on the legislative reform package. And sometimes this allows member states to, uh, to act as though they're operating in a vacuum. Whereas in fact, we know there are very clear detailed standards in the current legal framework. Work. The third element I would say is in interpretation of EU law and primarily looking at, at greater work with courts. This would involve training judges, but also encouraging in um, diplomatic and subtle ways, encouraging the use of preliminary references, for instance. Um, and there, I think there is a certain neutrality and trust that may come from NHRIs um, that civil society does sometimes but does not necessarily have. Um, fourthly, monitoring EU funding where it is being used in ways that imply either complicit or uh, cl complicity or direct support for human rights violations. Um, this is work that, that we've already started doing and where I think we would appreciate uh, greater involvement of NHRIs, particularly if we look at the great the increased amount of money coming into border issues from in the next uh, EU multi-annual financial framework. Finally, influencing the EU legislative framework um, and the pact. Um, I'll give a few examples to illustrate this. Um, first of all, you know, why do this? Well, of course, as we know, key EU policymakers are in capitals, and that's in a sense increasingly the case. So of the two co-legislators, the council in some senses is stronger 
um, without all the details, we are seeing a trend towards renationalization in some senses or to intergovernmental forms of uh, approaching legislative design, even under community competences. Within member states, we also see a tendency for officials in permanent representations on these issues to be getting greater direction from capitals than may have been the case before. All of that means that the locus of power and influence is uh, physically, in a sense, in capitals. And there we're talking about ministers, participating in EU policy, legislative processes, officials and advisors working on EU legislative processes, and national parliaments and political parties. Um, on the issues of asylum and migration, we find that the Commission can be quite supine. It's not always assertive. It follows and uh, declares that it follows what the member states want. So that again takes us to the member state uh, focus. I think even when it comes to the other co-legislator, the European Parliament, um, there is a, a greater work that can be done to make the link between political parties that have strong presence and a strong stance in the European Parliament and their counterparts or their, their motherships, let us say, in the capitals, particularly where those parties are part of governing coalitions. Um, and we see a certain disconnect between the positioning of some of those parties um, that I think can be addressed. As a caveat, debate on EU legislative legislative issues, including the pact, in member state capitals needs to be detailed and technical. I don't think this is an area for public advocacy, and I don't think it's an area for public mobilisation. And uh, we can discuss that more um, if others disagree. For civil society, this can sometimes be a challenge for us. Um, advocacy often focuses on national uh, level issues, national legislation, and NGOs may simply not have the resources to add in EU advocacy on top of that. Looking at transposition and compliance is often done, um, but perhaps not at the details of the legislative framework and targeting the people in ministries that are influencing that. And sometimes there's a tendency to equate the EU with Brussels and with the Commission and to a lesser extent with Parliament and to bring national level evidence to Brussels, both physically and institutionally, which is important, but more power and more influ influential players may be sitting in the capitals. Um, as a side note, we're not just talking about the EU, we're also talking about international human rights law and uh, in particular the convention. All elements of execution of judgments remain uh, extremely crucial. And I know this is already an issue for many NHRIs um, and it's something that we follow closely and are happy to work on more. Um, I think there's increasingly a debate about properly doing a risk assessment before pursuing litigation in Strasbourg. Sometimes there's no choice, but there are risks attached to doing that as recent judgments show. Um, and then there's the, the question of engagement with other international mechanisms. There may be no direct um, impact, unfortunately. However, this serves to create evidence that can have um, uh, play a role in some of the discussions um, that we had. Let me conclude with a couple of comments on the second topic, cooperation between NHRIs and NGOs, how to make it work. I think it works best when each side is able to do their separate job. Um, best cooperation comes when each is functioning healthily and fully resourced. When that's not the case, we shouldn't be insisting on cooperation. And in particular, we see across Europe some situations of state capture of NHRIs. Um, and in that case, cooperation can even be problematic. The mode of cooperation um, is often best as one that is informal, that is parallel and coordinated action and behind the scenes action. This preserves the distinct role of NHRIs and it should be distinct from the role of NGOs and also distinct from the role of international organizations. Um, NGOs sometimes request NHRIs to be more outspoken 
in certain contexts, that's not necessarily valuable. I think, for instance, international organizations can be more outspoken. NHRIs, the strategy pursued depends on what's most likely to be effective. We need NHRIs to be robust and independent and expert, but in a way that is separate from and reinforces NGO work. Um, I think there's a strong role for NHRIs in convening NGOs and other parts of civil society, such as private sector, professional bodies that have a role to play on this issue and um, can be mobilised more. And I think there's a particular value of cooperation at the intersection of asylum law and other areas of law, um, in particular criminal law, approaches to international organised crime, at the intersection of digital rights and asylum questions, and at the wider intersection of rule of law issues and asylum and migration. Um, finally, on the pact, clearly there's multiple areas for cooperation on the pact. Um, the one that's been discussed so far is the independent border monitoring mechanism. Um, I'll use this as a, as a brief example. I won't repeat our recommendations on this. We agree, agree entirely with Milena from BVMN on what are the conditions and the requirements for the mechanism. Looking at the statement from Enri, I see also strong overlap in terms of the requirements. Right now, member states are trying to water down the proposal and are suggesting that existing mechanisms could be used rather than setting up new mechanisms. Um, in some cases, that involves mechanisms that are captured by the state and therefore not independent. Um, supporting the parliament to resist and remain robust, I think, is important. Developing model proposals is also important even if we're not saying that one proposal fits all contexts, a proposal that looks at how to put in place the core red line elements that we identify, I think is important. Um, finally, we shouldn't just focus on this border mechanism. To some extent, I think there's a risk that this becomes a bit of a smokescreen. There's so many elements in the PAC proposals that are problematic from a fundamental rights point of view. Um, you can read our now hundreds of pages of analysis, which is actually, I think, longer than the PAC documents themselves, um, to see our detailed um, problems, but to highlight a few procedures, introduction of substandard procedures in the border context and on territory. Um, see our flow chart setting this out. The increased focus on the borders, particularly in times of crisis. The use of detention at borders in screening and in the border procedure and in certain other special procedures, which we have to keep in mind, not just the proposed border procedure. The punitive approach to applicants, which remains in the RAM proposal, although is not as extensive as in Dublin 4. The general rule of law problems the misuse of force measure, which would set a dangerous precedent, the weakening of guarantees, which are still presented as special luxuries for asylum cases rather than fundamental elements of any legal process. Um, the fact that the proposals are complex, unworkable and unfair, which leads us to be concerned that even if they're accepted um, and become a part of become the legislative framework they won't be implemented um, and we'll again be operating in, in a sense of vacuum and impunity for member states um, other elements the asylum agency has been mentioned um, in the absence of agreement on the legislative uh, package up. yeah um, then um, I think we could continue to cooperate on this based on the 2017 agreements, including the role in compliance for the agency. Um, and then the question of external cooperation, which is my final point, um, where I, I think this is something where NHRIs haven't always uh, considered it part of their remit, but looking at how these many of these externalizing measures involve cooperation with repressive and rights violating state institutions in third countries, could there be a counterbalance with cooperation and reinforcement of independent human rights institutions in those contexts insofar as they exist? Thank you.
Thank you very much. Because of time, I'm not going to make a, a wrap up of your main points, uh, which actually were very, very well explained in your uh, presentation. Uh, I would have to immediately, because of time constraints, to turn to Adriano Silvestri, Program Manager on Asylum and Migration of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. Uh, of course, PRA is expected to play a key role in the implementation of some of the legislative proposals under the EU Pact on Migration, although we heard some, some comments on that, on, on the content of that, of that pact. However, um, we would like to know how you intend to provide your technical assistance uh, to EU member states in designating and providing assistance in the functioning of national monitoring mechanisms and borders. What do you expect will be the main challenges and opportunities for FRA under this, uh, this issue? And uh, finally, what would be FRA's top two recommendations to ensure change at the national level across Europe for better human rights protection at the borders? Mr. Silvestri, the time, 10 minutes, is for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, Thank you very much for having invited us to this discussion. I'll start with the last question. I, I will be uh, short, I think, because I can build on what has been said already in the past. Uh, I'll highlight three aspects or three areas of work to trigger change triggering change being the, the, the headline of this uh, of this panel. First, if there is a problem, uh, we should speak about it. So it's important that we have uh, regular reports and I'll come back to that. Second, uh, let's try to use already existing EU law as much as we can. And third, I'll come back on the issue of the uh, uh, monitoring fundamental rights at borders. Uh, so on the first point, making the um, making the problem visible, so to speak, uh, this is uh, a challenge. Uh, I have been working now in the field of asylum and, and migration law for several decades, and I think we are at a stage uh, where the challenges at the external border are. Uh, of the European Union at least are as high as I have almost never seen them in the past uh, 30 years or so. So it is a serious issue and uh, what FRA can do here is to continue to uh, report about it. Next week, the fundamental rights uh, uh, report, so the, the annual report, the flagship report of the agency will be published and we will have, as in the past years, uh, a section speaking to external borders, highlighting essentially uh, the three big uh, uh, issues one is the, and I use the term pushback in general terms now, So, but anyway, the illegal acts uh, and allegations thereof at borders. Secondly, the situation of uh, search and rescue at sea and people dying at sea. And thirdly, the, the way uh, or the obstacles that civil society and, and other humanitarian actors face. Um, the reason why I think that the situation at the external border is uh, particularly challenging now is not only the fact that allegations of uh, violations reported are persistent, are grave, but also that they are sometimes minimized. And I think, and maybe this is also a, a self-reflection, there is a need to better unpack the term pushbacks. Pushbacks can be perceived as something uh, differently depending on who you talk to. But in fact, often we are speaking of very serious criminal acts, uh, bodily injuries, uh, theft, and, and so on. And I think it's important to really unpack what often goes under this general heading of pushbacks and, and uh, link it to the various fundamental rights uh, that, are, um, that are affected. And secondly, the other challenge is that the law as it stands, is being questioned. We've seen all the cases around uh, the, the, the Hungary situation that brought to several um, uh, judgments. But this questioning of the law uh, also leads to uh, putting in question things that up to recently were taken for granted by everybody. I mean, one example is the recent discussions around uh, how far you can go when you do uh, border surveillance in the, uh, and you protect the territorial sea uh, at the Greek-Turkish border. So I think it's important here to report and unpack what is actually happening. 
The second point I want to make is, uh, is about the current EU law. There's a lot of discussion about the pact, but there are already a number of hooks, I would say, in EU law that can be used to trigger change or to improve or to address the situations. But it's important, I think as Catherine pointed out uh, indirectly, if I understood you correctly, that EU law is an animal of its own in a way. I mean, you have to consider that uh, uh, EU law is not like human rights law. It does not apply top down to everything, but it's like when you go to a forest, there are certain areas where you have a lot of mushrooms and there are some areas where you have few mushrooms and EU law are only the mushrooms. What is in between the mushrooms is not EU law and uh, the EU institutions cannot do anything with it, at least not legally. Um, so it's important really to be aware uh, when you speak about the situation of fundamental rights at external border, that the angle to which EU law comes in is a task that has been given to the, to the European Union to work on border management. So the starting point is this concept of integrated border management as set out in the European Border and Coast Guard Regulation, which contains fundamental rights as one horizontal component and uh, on which one can build upon. I, I, I guess probably hardly anybody among this, the, the, the audience is aware of uh, the fact that uh, Article 31C of the European Border uh, and Coast Guard Regulation that describes what, this, what the integrated border management should be. This is sort of the strategy and how you do border management. And that speaks to interagency cooperation, initially thought to make sure that the border guards cooperate with the customs and uh, uh, with, with, the, with the police, also contains an obligation where relevant to cooperate with actors in charge of the protection of fundamental rights. In most member states, this is dead law. There's much more than can be done on this. And similarly, building on what the previous panel highlighted and, and Matthias, uh, Matthias Earl highlighted, we have in many of the sectors of the external border where there are reports about fundamental rights abuses, we have Frontex, which is present. And Frontex has a lot of internal I'm saying internal, not external independent, but internal, partly, however, uh, uh, semi independent tools that um, all of us can help strengthen and, uh, and, and feed with information and, and support from the outside to make them work. And finally, uh, let me come to the to the monitoring. Um, there's been a lot of it has been discussed. I think we, as Fundamental Rights Agency, we welcome the idea of the monitoring. Uh, we find uh, the experiences uh, that was gathered in article, I mean, through the return directive or through Article 86 of the return directive in monitoring forced returns as being a good starting point. Uh, although at the, on the uh, on the situation at external borders, it's more challenging. You, you are not sitting in a plane or, a, 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 I mean, you're not like in the, in a situation of removal where you can accompany the whole process and see everything, the collection of evidence is much more complex there. But um, this, this uh, monitoring to work uh, should not be done in isolation, so to speak. It's important, but it's also important that it's seen as part of a, a, of a larger menu. I think Eva from the previous, uh, previous panel highlighted the importance of investigations. I haven't counted it, but probably I would guess that if we count the cases uh, concerning pushbacks and violations at external borders uh, that are pending in front of national jurisdictions and the cases that are pending in front of Strasbourg, you probably end up with more cases in Strasbourg than in all the EU member states together. And this cannot be, cannot be uh, the situation. There is much more that I can, there has to be done. From our pers perspective, as regarding this last point, yes, we have been tasked to produce guidance. Uh, the, uh, so far, we haven't started drafting, so to speak, but we've started collecting. And uh, at this um, event, uh, already several of these instruments or these papers that, uh, that we have collected have been referred to, so I will not repeat them. I did not find a reference to the UNHCR and OHCHR consultation, which was done uh, previously this year in, in February, I think, which is also a very valuable document. Neither was there a reference to the CPT annual report, which also contains uh, valuable guidance. So what we have done so far is that we've collected all this and what we'll probably do, but I'm saying probably because I'm, we need to see what is most needed, is probably distill all these materials 
in order to pull out what is most essential. So to do something which is simple and clear and sets out those principles around the independence, the scope, the effectiveness, the accountability of the monitoring that need to be said in simple and, 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 and uh, clear manner for, for everyone. I'll, I'll stop here uh, so that we have a chance for some... Uh, uh, thank you very much, Adrian, actually. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be with such a wonderful panel. And of course, with all these uh, members from our, from our network and people from our network in order to share this opportunity. Thank you very much uh, for, for this.